Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, we're glad to have you here. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, From Reclaiming to Reclaimed, the Big Picture and a Case Study in Space Reclamation, which is sponsored by ProQuest. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to take a few moments to point out some features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. Please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our panelists. At the end of the presentation, we will take a few minutes to answer your questions. So please do submit them throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat panel to alert the host, and he will troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Please also note that today's program is being recorded, and all re registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. And now, I am pleased to briefly introduce our speakers today. Kevin Sturr will be speaking first. He is the Vice President, North America Sales at ProQuest. Following him will be Bobby Hollinsworth. Bobby is the Learning Commons Coordinator at Clemson University's Libraries. At this point, we're ready to get started, so I will turn the floor over to you, Kevin. All right. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Stair, and as Mark mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Sales for ProQuest North America. And joining me today is uh, Bobby Hollinsworth, the Learning Commons and Digital Studio Coordinator at Clemson. And so Bobby's going to cover most of our session today. I'm just going to kick things off a bit, make a few comments, and then share with you all uh, a survey, the results of a survey ProQuest commissioned on space reclamation to provide a kind of 30,000-foot view of what's happening in the marketplace, and then we'll get right into the brass tacks of things with a case study and entertain some questions with Bobby. So obviously this is a session on space reclamation, and some folks out in the audience likely refer to it as space repurposing or some other term. But whatever you call it, one thing is clear, that this is a very hot topic. I can tell you that uh, not one day, not one week goes by that my team across North America is not engaged in some level, at some level, one way or the other, in small and large projects uh, associated with, with uh, space reclamation. And uh, to that end, I find this to be extremely fascinating and interesting because it brings so much together in terms of strategic planning, um, content diversity planning, uh, you name it, the library is really pulled in a different direction. And with that comes a lot of questions and issues around change management, and that's why I find it so fascinating. What I'd like to share with you before we jump, jump into the case study with Clemson is a real quick example of one of those many instances where ProQuest has worked with libraries across the country and across Canada. Uh, to engage in space reclamation. And the example that I'd love to share is with uh, the University of Southern California. We worked with the University of Southern California, John McDonald in particular, to help with the content diversity strategy that also entailed looking at space reclamation. And as we worked with the library staff, uh, they identified key areas, as you can see here, it's an actual layout of their library. Uh, we identified music scores, uh, dissertations, as well as microfilm. And from that, they were able to identify areas where they could invest more in terms of flexing uh, investment and allocating space to better support their staff as one of the byproducts of their content diversity, sorry, their uh, space reclamation plan. And just walk you through a couple of real life examples. This is obviously a picture of their stack. It's where we started with the project. Um, identified the dissertations uh, that ultimately would be digitized and available on ProQuest for everyone to research but also within free up space. Here is uh, John McDonald and all of us working through the stacks, identifying those particular areas that needed to be reclaimed. This is a picture of those dissertations as an example, sitting in the warehouse. And then ultimately we filled up two semi-trucks that made their way, called the Prince Electronic Road Trip, uh, from Southern California up to Ann Arbor. And once the materials arrived up in Ann Arbor, obviously they arrived at ProQuest, put them in our warehouse, and got busy digitizing. This is an actual example, a couple pictures of us 
going through the digitization process to take those print dissertations that you saw earlier and get them up onto ProQuest and make them available from a digital standpoint, thereby freeing up the space. And here's that freed up space, as you can see. And uh, ultimately, as I mentioned, they were looking for added, added uh, space for staff, and this is a great example or a picture of the byproduct of the space reclamation efforts. They were able to take those, those areas that had lots of microfilm and dissertations and music scores and replace it with um, much needed space to support the staff and better support uh, students and faculty. So, you know, I think that's a, just kind of a nice visual to walk through very quickly of how ProQuest has worked with libraries. I, I can tell you, as I mentioned, that we're very engaged in working with libraries across the country in this space, so much so that we have invested in a full team of folks who work here in Ann Arbor, our headquarters, who uh, basically do nothing but analysis of holdings for libraries to provide a guideline or a roadmap to help you better understand what your options are in terms of converting print to electronic. So if you're interested in taking advantage of that complimentary service, it is absolutely free. Uh, please let us know at the end of the session and we'd be happy to follow up with you. So I mentioned the survey results earlier and the survey results uh, you can see here we participated and commissioned a survey of 608 participants from June through September of 2016. And you can see the profile in terms of the libraries that we reached out to to ask a series of questions around space reclamation. You can see the preponderance of them came out of academic. Uh, we had some out of community colleges, and most of them lived in the United States, although we had a few coming out of uh, the U.S., sorry, out of Canada. And let's walk through just a handful of those questions. And this is going to be the fun part uh, of this session because you're going to be able to ask or answer these questions, a little challenge for you. So the number one question here is what percent of those participants in the survey say that space reclamation is a priority or will be a priority in the near future? It's a multiple choice question, 13, 82, or 97%. Think about it. All right, you ready? Here we go. 82%. So we talked about at the very beginning of this how this is really a hot topic, and I think that the survey results reflect that at 82%. The next question is, what percent have considered space reclamation a priority over the last five years? Has this been a longstanding thing, or is it really starting to ramp up now? So we have three possibilities here, 12%. 31% or 74%? Here we go. Pick your, pick your choice. 31%. So that's interesting when you juxtapose the 31% versus the 82%. We're seeing a rapid increase in interest in space reclamation and corresponding questions and, and hunger for best practices along that front as well. Number three, what percent are using reclaimed space for collaborative space? This is a big one. 13%, 38%, or 83%? I think most people will probably get this one right. Here we go. 83%. So when we do move in space reclamation, it's typically uh, for collaboration needs. The next question, what percent are planning to build I'm sorry, are planning to build maker spaces or hacker spaces? 5%, 25%, or 55%? 25%. And the last question, what percent have increased funding for space reclamation? Now, this one should be a really easy one for everyone to get, I think. 6%, 16%, or 26%? Here we go, 6%. So I don't think many were probably surprised by that. It's one of the challenges we have in space reclamation is how do we do um, these moves and be successful and not be disruptive with our own internal resources and not much, if any, additional funding. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby to take us into his own case uh, study example at Clemson. Thanks, Kevin, appreciate it. Yes, those are very interesting numbers and a lot of that I'm sure will be, you know, um, you know, 
if it's been the last five years or something you're going to do in the future, that is definitely something that um, we have been looking at at Clemson for, you know, a little over six years now. And what I'm going to talk to, talk to everybody about today is going to be uh, the things that we have done and kind of how, the way, how we got through it. So there's going to be a lot of slides, a ton of slides, because I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. And yeah, everybody wants to see the before and after, you know, kind of a, you know, um, uh, HGTV kind of thing. So anyway, but just to, just to let you guys know that um, that what we've done is we've done uh, this in five spaces, four spaces uh, mostly, but one project had two separate spaces that, that we worked on. So how did it all come about? Well, it came about um, back in 2010, or actually a little bit pro before 2010, and what happened is uh, the Clemson Computing and Information Technology, CCIT, our version of, of campus IT, they needed a new home. Uh, their building was, was falling apart, uh, no longer, you know, uh, a situation that uh, your IT department should have been in. So they needed a new home. And Cooper Library seemed like a logical place. We had some space, um, so we, we got them involved, and with that, um, they've moved in the second floor. It has a floor on the main floor, but most of the support has remained on the second floor uh, of the library. So with that, you know, kind of agreement, mo them moving in, we were given some funds to, you know, do some, you know, cosmetic surgery <laughs> on the, on the, on the uh, you know, on the library on what we had here. So what we were looking to do is, uh, you know, put in a learning commons. Okay, and that was 2010. As you guys know, I mean, information commons was the buzzword back in you know, early 2000s, kind of more from learning commons. This is 2010 we're talking about. And basically, what we're looking at interactive collaborative learning space um, used with technology, services, uh, mostly to assist students with information and research needs, you know, obviously. So um, what we did, and I'll start off by, by just kind of showing you this. Uh, you know, this is a blueprint or kind of a, you know, a, a, what our library looks like. The fourth floor of the library is actually when you walk in. You know, when you walk in, you're actually on the fourth floor. Three floors below you, two floors ahead of you, uh, up above. Okay, so down at the very bottom here, um, if you see the, uh, the very, at the very bottom of the slide, kind of to the right, you'll see uh, a little blocked off area that says brown room and down below that. That's going to be the entrance right here, uh, right beside the brown room. So when you walk in, the first thing you're going to see on the right is going to be the brown room over here on your right. And then out to the left is going to be the Learning Commons East. You'll see that if you go back further into the space. Over on the other side, you're going to see the Learning Commons West. And also back in the very back where you see the fifth and sixth floor tab up there, you'll see GIS stuff, geospatial technology, study rooms, that sort of thing. That's going to be some areas. So what I'm going to show you is GIS. I'm going to show you learning commons. I'm going to show you brown room. And then we're going to go up to the fifth floor in just a little bit, and I'll show you what the Adobe Digital Studio is going to look like. Okay? All right. So what we're going to do is, first off, let me get this... Some of you guys will be familiar with this. Um, the reference area prior to 2010, and you guys have seen this before. Okay, Clemson is orange. You'll see the orange caps. Okay, you're going to see orange carpet in a minute here too, so just, you know, avert your eyes. But had index tables. We see, you see the reference, uh, the reference collection was over here. What we were repurposing was this area, which is the reference area, and making it into something that would be more flexible and more collaborative, as Kevin mentioned before. So I'll show you a few more slides here from this. Got the index table with reference, uh, you know, reference uh, print sources on here. Over here on the back side over here, as I mentioned before on the left side, that's going to be, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, 13, 15 tall shelves taking up a lot of space over here. Index tables taking up a lot of space as well. One more shot of this. Like I said before, I got a lot of pictures here before and after. Here's another shot kind of from the, you know, from the stairs looking down over in the far in the back there. You see the reference area and also the stacks and uh, the index tables. And one more. Okay, so we had several phases here. In phase one, what we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, get the reference collection out. Okay, so what we did, we moved that in the beginning there when I showed you the blueprint, we had the, the east side and the west side. We moved the reference collection from the east side over to the west side. And I guess the, the main thing here was, you know, it's kind of like, 
uh, taking away Linus's blanket, you know, um, the security blanket there. We moved it over to the other side, and I think the challenge is our, our supervisor told us, like, how many times do you go over there now? Now it's in a different location. Well, the answer was not a lot. Okay, so what we did after we did that, and I'll talk more about that later on, but we were able to weed that and moved it over to the other side. Uh, that's 13, like I said, 13 to 15 ranges. We had 15 ranges, two were moved earlier, 13 were moved uh, in 2010. That's the, the feet right there, 1404, 1620 feet of shelving, you know, books. That's how much space, that's how much area we had, uh, linear feet there for books. The reference desk was removed, tables and chairs removed, and the carpet was also removed. Okay. This is what it looked like when we did it. I mentioned the orange carpet here. Okay, so orange carpet, what you got is you've got um, 1966, October 66 is when the building was opened. So that's 10, 50 years. Uh, 2010, you know, this orange carpet came with the building, so you can see what happened is you'd move, you'd, you'd change the carpet around, but of course you weren't moving the shelves, uh, the, the actual stacks. So anytime you move a stack around here, a shelf, you're gonna have orange carpet underneath. And you'll see this is this, this, this problem keeps coming up and up and up, so we'll, we'll show you that. But that's what it looked like when we cleared those out. And you see how much space we got now. You can see it kind of coming into something. We got a student still working here, even though we're in the middle of this renovation. This was in the summer of 2010. Moving the reference desk, removing it. We also, you know, it's a good thing to have, you know, some sort of visual, some sort of idea as to, you know, uh, what you're going to do in this space. So we let students know what was coming, uh, wanted their ideas, if they had ideas about what was coming. So area was painted, as you were seeing, new carpet, new reference to circulation desk, and added the CCIT desk. Remember, that's the IT. They had a helper or a student that would be back behind the reference desk at this point. More electrical outlets, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit as far as the outlets go. New furniture that included tables, chairs, and whiteboards. And there's the painting right there. You can see all the space we got. Putting the carpet in. There's the, car, the carpet in there and painted. And then the furniture arrives. We went with steel case as far as furniture goes, if anyone had that question. And you can see and we're actually adding to the wall here, and I'm sure you guys, let me go back one here, I'm sure you guys have had this problem before where you've got columns here, and where do you get electricity unless you core drill? So what we were doing is we put it along the walls here and hoped that would be enough, and you'll see a little bit later that that wasn't quite enough. So, okay, so there's the new reference desk. They're putting it together before they install it. And once again, more tables installing. There's our chairs that came in. Learning Commons Phase 1 completed, open in August 2010. And this is what it looked like. We got higher chairs here. You see the outlets on the wall over there. Um, and that was one of the big problems that we have with outlets. I'll just kind of go through these to show you the, the furniture that came in. Some of this has been recovered, you know, as far as the, the green is not green anymore. It's a gray now. The, the green wore out pretty quickly. But uh, you can see what we did. Can't really see here, but there is a there is a um, column on the side here. And what you do is you get the column and you run out these little areas here. You kind of make it look a little private, but not quite private. These are nice collaborative areas, as you can see here. But you can run power from those columns out with the beam. And I think it's what they call post and beam kind of uh, design. And you can see it there as well. You see the, the column on the right there with the electricity, and that went into the station there. And you see, once again, let me point something out before we get into phase two. You see these big areas to the left there, a lot of space there we could be using, and I'll talk more about that in phase two. The nice thing about it, it allowed for collaborative collaborative spaces, but also individual study as well. It did a little bit of both, and that was the whole idea. Diner seating, what we call this. The students really like that a lot, still like it a lot. So phase two, 2011-2012 Learning Commons phase two. And why did we do a phase two? What we could see is a group was, was formed, as I mentioned, those, those gaps. You could see it pretty early on. It was pretty evident you had some gaps in there. And what would happen is you would see students come into the area, walk around the area, 
and go somewhere else. So you had these turnaways, and then we could see that because all those seats were filled. You know, we didn't have enough seats. So we knew right away we had a problem. We had a good thing, and it was what we wanted. We needed more is what we needed. Okay, and I'll tell you one thing that, that really convinced us is when we went to North Carolina State University, uh, Hill Library, DH Hill Library, we toured the Learning Commons there. They had a lot more concentration of seating. And I started thinking, well, you know what? We could probably get a lot more in here, and I don't think it would really bother anybody. Um, uh, so let me keep going here. Suggestion box, what we did, we put up the suggestion box uh, on the reference desk, asked students what they wanted, because they had, they had, you know, they had a little bit of time to, to, to go through the phase one, what they liked, what they didn't like. So we put that together. Factored in observations, that's once again the, the turnaways. And uh, the group together put together a final report for phase two. And the suggestion box rendered 50% dealt with furniture, wanted more furniture. Remember the turnaways. Uh, power outlets, you know, wanted more power, wanted more accessible power. Study rooms, we couldn't really do that much, do much for that here. We did do that later on with some other areas, but we couldn't do that here. More whiteboards, which we also addressed. Computers, we addressed that as well. And um, What we recommended was that we get more furniture, we get electrical outlets, technology, learning tools, art, and we did some of that. Okay, we did a majority of that. To start, we, started, we decided to start with the furniture first and then work on the technology. So what we did, we went and got the, tech, got the furniture going, uh, got the original designers. We didn't want it to be uh, interrupted in any way. We wanted that continuity from the first design to the second. So we got the same designers, which was a very good idea. Uh, it was approved in the fall of 2011, and the new furniture was installed during the 2011 Christmas break. So while the students were away, they came back and they got a lot more in the commons. Okay, here's where it, it, it got interesting because what we had in the phase one was 88 seats. With the, with the phase two, we were able to add 107 more seats for a total of 195 seats. So you can see it really brought up the number of, you know, hopefully, you know, we still get turnaways. To this day, we still get turnaways because it is a popular place, but you can see we, we up the, uh, the concentration once again, the density of it. Larger collaborative tables we brought in, more bar seating, that's the high seating with the higher chairs, brought those in as well. Individual study areas, uh, and little areas where you didn't have to be with a collaborative group, we had some of that too. Uh, brought in whiteboards, diner seating, and uh, more power. Okay, and then you'll see it. Here's what it looks like. I mean, you'll see, you, I can't get a big scope of this, but you can see the little areas. That's the low seating right there. And then you got the higher seating, which I call the bar, the bar seating, bar chairs. Whiteboards brought in more of that. And you see below the whiteboards here, those little receptacles, that's more power right there. So we're getting more power in here. There's the movable whiteboards, and I'll go over this in just a second, what we brought in. Um, technology 10 Max. Uh, during the, tw the 2012 spring, these are iMacs with uh, Adobe CS6 and Premium, uh, the, uh, CSX Premium, uh, 10 mobile whiteboards, four Mac Pros with dual 21-inch monitors, Adobe CS6 Master Collection and Final Cut Pro, and this is where we started kind of getting our digital studio going. This is the, the, the forerunner of our digital studio, which I'll talk about more in just a minute here. Uh, 20 cameras, we also brought in technology. We figured if we were going to maybe go into that whole area of digital a digital studio, we need to have that capture ability for students to get them nice, you know, high-end camcorders and DSLR cameras. So we got those as well for checkout. Ten iPads for checkout, and we brought in tripods, GPS, projectors, portable DVD players, and external drives as well. And you can kind of see here that post and beam situation I was telling you about, coming off this column and bringing it out. And that's what we were doing with this. And once again, the collaborative areas here. That's our forerunner right there. That's the Mac Pros right there, the forerunner to what would become the Digital Studio, which I'll talk about in just a little bit here. So services, um, Writing Center came in, in the fall of 2012. They actually have, um, they're actually um, located in the Academic Success Center, but they have satellite hours here from 7 to 9, uh, Sunday through Thursday. So they come over here because it is such a popular place. 
tutoring was here, but it moved out back over to academic success. They still are here during the summer, but they were here for a little while, and then they moved on out. Career Center, I've been always trying to get the Career Center in here. I've been working with it. I need to keep working with them to get some sort of, um, you know, resume writing, especially when you have the uh, career days and things like that. GIS, this is something I was looking on, and we'll, we'll talk more about that, that actually did happen. And we're always looking for partners, always looking for something to go under one roof to make students' life easier because, and as I'll talk later, uh, why we did all this, I'll get into all that in just a second. Okay, so phase three began in the summer of 2013, the creation of the Cooper Digital Studio. Okay, as I mentioned, that space before was a reference area. Okay, a reference area that we transformed into a more collaborative type area, moved the stacks. This space that you're looking at right here is the former, a uh, former workspace. It was cataloging. There's two cataloging areas that I'm gonna talk about. This was the former cataloging area that, 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 that was moved out. And what we did is we wanted to go ahead and get, got the green light on creating a digital studio. You can see what it looked like from here. And we're gonna call this the Cooper Digital Studio. Former workspace, open spring of 2014. 12 dual monitor co computers, six Macs, six PCs, green screen, two large bed scanners, Adobe CS6 Creative Suite, Final Cut Pro, AutoCAD, support for digital creation projects. Uh, transition to Adobe Digital Studio in October 2015, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. See, it's very bare bones. Doesn't look a whole lot different. We painted the walls, put in computers. We knew we were gonna be moving soon, so we just said, no frills, let's get it going. Instead of going into the Adobe Digital Studio, at, you know, just hitting the gas, we'd at least be at maybe 50 miles an hour before we hit that, you know, we'd at least know what's going on. So we had this open for a year before we moved upstairs to the Adobe Digital Studio. And I'll scan through some photos here real quick of what that beginning studio looked like. And there's the fifth floor right there. This is right above the, the, the blueprint I showed you earlier. Over to the left, in the corner of the left-hand bottom corner here, you see Adobe Digital Studio. And you'll see that right below that, you'll see the stairs. So when you go in the lobby, you can actually see up in there. And I'll get into all that in just a second here as far as what, what happened there. Okay. So Adobe Digital Studio opened in October 2015. Uh, 2,475, 57 square feet. Library, CCIT, and Adobe collaboration as far as who funded it. Video production studio, audio production studio, seven large screen monitors, plug and work, four dual screen IMAX for post-production. And the whole thing that brought this whole project on was getting the Adobe Creative Cloud. When we got that for the whole campus, that's when the Adobe Digital Studio kind of took off. We were in the works for that. We were getting the other studio going, and we knew that we were going to be moving. So as I said before, we didn't put a whole lot of work into making that the prettiest place in the world because we didn't, we didn't need to. And you see the staffing hours there. We've got um, a media consultant who is full-time. He works with, uh, uh, he's part of the library. He works with interns and also work study to staff the lab, uh, excuse me, to staff the studios and uh, go from there. Here's a look at what it was before we, we came in and, and put the studio in. And you can see, once again, orange carpet right there. We moved some, these were bound volumes, uh, journals, moved those out to our storage facility and started work on the project. And I'll give you a few more shots of this the before and after here. This is an interesting shot right here because what they ended up doing was taking out, you can see with the Robert Muldrow Cooper here, there's gonna be, and you'll see in a second here, they took out two huge parts of this wall and left the column that was there in place. So I'll get to that in a second, but it's, it's a very, um, you know, one of those wow kind of things when you see it later on. And you can see it inside here, they're taking out the carpet, They've got it framed in over here on the left, what they're gonna take out as far as the wall goes up to the fifth floor. And there's the um, lobby view of it as well. And you've got the actual wall gone now from the studio side here. And I'll show you the lobby side in a minute here. This structure in the middle that has the uh, framing on it, that's gonna be the actual video uh, production area, that's the studio. And we'll see, I'll show you a picture of that later on with the green screen and everything in there, but that's the actual structure. And you'll see them 
That's the cutout once again from the lobby up into the studio. Now they're putting the wood veneer on the studio. And you'll see, let me go back one, you'll see it back here. Back in the back, you'll see a little door there on the left-hand side. That is into the audio studio right there. That's the finished product. This is a professional, these are really nice pictures here, professional uh, photography here. That's as you turn around from the steps, turning right into the studio. That's a straight on shot. And you can see on the left side there, the two uh, wall, the, you know, the, the, the column here when the wall was removed. Once again, there's the structure, the architectural statement, I guess is what you call it. Um, and there's an, in, there's an outside shot right there of the nice thing about this, what, they, what the architect wanted to do, and I thought it was a great idea, is bring the studio out five feet from the what the wall was there. So it comes out into the lobby. So when you walk in, your, immediate, your eyes immediately go up there and say, hey, what's that? What's going on up there? I want to know. And that's, that's had that effect as well. So it's, uh, it's an interesting, when you walk in, they, you definitely will, will notice it. That's taking, looking left as soon as you walk in the building, that's what you're going to see up there. There's the green screen. Uh, and Wesley, our media consultant there in the green screen, green screen uh, video studio. That's looking from this on the fifth floor, looking up onto the sixth floor through the wall that was cut out. And one more shot from the sixth floor looking in. Okay, so I'm going to move to the brown room. Remember, the brown room is on the fourth floor as you first walk into the library. And the brown room was before. It was a renovated space opened in October 2013, a uh, collaboration of CCIT, library, and Dell computers, and a former, former meeting room. When I got here 10 years ago, it wasn't even a meeting room. It was kind of, kind of more like a museum type thing, you know, a museum. Uh, and they made it a meeting room. And then I think they renovated it again, and finally we renovated it for the last time uh, several years ago. Uh, 893 square feet, visualization wall. It's got 15 46-inch monitors, 17 feet by 6 feet, 17 wide, 6 feet high. Uh, three projectors, 16 laptops in there, a classroom presentation space. There's a hyper wall on the outside, which allows you to advertise uh, what's going on in the university and what's happening. So I'll show you all that in just a second here. Uh, it's comfortable uh, for, for 16 at the table, but you can put a lot more. You can move the tables out, get a lot more people in there if you want for presentation. It's a pretty, pretty versatile room. That's once again cutting. Uh, this is our first. This actually happened before the Adobe, Adobe Digital Studio. This is actually cutting a wall out. That was our first experience with cutting a, a wall out in the library. Like I said, this is right as you enter the library. And there's the wall out on the left. And there, you know, the whole reason behind this is to get, you know, when people go by, it just wasn't that just that door there under Edgar Brown. It wasn't just that door. You could see more in. You want the whole idea once again. You go in the lobby. You want to see what's happening in there. And that, that, that cutout right there lets you see what's on the visualization wall. So you actually can kind of see, even though maybe you're not in that room, you can say, hey, that, that's pretty interesting. What's going on on in there? I want to know more about that. So. That's the whole idea. Here's the opening ceremony. You can see uh, the cut out the wall right there, uh, and you can see behind it a little bit of the viz wall, but not, not too much. There's the hyper wall right there underneath that portrait. That's the one that's going to have things like maybe some tweets going on, uh, what's happening on campus, advertisements on a rolling, rolling kind of uh, uh, file that's going to what's going on in the library, what's going on, on campus. So when people walk in, they have a good idea what's happening already. There's the visualization wall right there. I'll show you a few more shots of that. There's students, a great presentation space. Uh, students, you know, use this sometimes. We have it for events. Uh, it's become kind of the nice, smaller uh, presentation area if you just want to, you know, kind of get together. It is open for universe. Open for classrooms is basically what it's for, for multi multimedia type classroom situation for, you know, professors will book it for the whole semester. You see the, the projections on the wall. So no, no matter where you're sitting, you're going to get a good good view of the of what the presenter is is showing you presentation. 
one more shot, and then we're going to move over to GIS. GIS is, of course, a geographic information system, library, and CCIT collaboration. Opened in the fall of 2015, so it was right, right there at the same time that we opened up the Adobe Digital Studio. It's actually two spaces. There's a classroom and also the workspace or lab. And, you know, for the classroom, we wanted a classroom so that actually, uh, you know, we have a staff for GIS through CCIT that teach in that area. So they're going to teach all the different applications and, and you know, we have classrooms all throughout the semester on GIS. So that's going to be your classroom. The workspace or lab is going to be an area where you've got, they've actually got a sandbox. I don't have a picture of that, but they have a sandbox where you can actually see with the camera on it, you can actually see, you know, how, um, you know, topography and all this stuff works as far as the GIS area. The classroom is 662 square feet. The lab is 1643. That lab is exactly like I mentioned before. That's where we first um, had the digital studio. So that was the area, and you'll see in a second here how it's transformed as well. Class seats 20, dual monitor computers, and the lab has 11 dual monitor computers and one plug and work station. That's what it looks like now. So they did a great job with it. We kind of, like I said, we just, uh, you know, we did the bare bones there. They put carpet down, painted a different color, made it look a lot more attractive, and it's a very, it's a really high use space there. Here's the classroom from, you know, what it looked like. Uh, once again, it's the cataloging area. You see, we stripped it down, took the uh, drop ceilings off. That was a, you know, that was one of the things they took off, and I think it really helped out the space, made it look a lot bigger than it is. One more shot of that, and then the next shot is actually going to be them putting in the carpet paint and lighting eventually, and that's what it looks like now. Dual screen, like I said, 20 capacity. You get more in there too, but actually, computer is going to be 20 dual screen there, so you can actually do the te you can teach in that area. That's the backside with the continents on it. Okay, so here's the here's you know the why. Why did we do all this? And and you're probably thinking the same thing. Why did you do all this? Or somebody maybe your administrator saying, why do we need to do this? Why do you want to do this? Well, for us it was not a why, but more how because we kind of had to. You know, <laughs> the reason being is our, our Gate counts are increasing three, four percent every year. We've got a lot of people in this building, and I think it was 2007, I believe, we had uh, an architect come in and say, "Hey, how can we, how can we get more space in here?" They had a plan. They were going to do a lot of stuff. Well, as we all know, 2008 hit, and everything kind of went out the window. So that was not going to happen. And so what we had to start thinking about is. How do we do these things in the space that we do have? And as Kevin mentioned before and showed you at the beginning, you're going to have spaces, okay? And then you're going to have people, all right? And at some point, you've got to start figuring out and making those hard decisions about, do you want those people to be in here or do you want these spaces, uh, these, these areas with stacks and whatnot, even though very valuable? Do they need to be in this space or do you want more people in here? And that's the decisions we had to make. So we are very lucky. We have an off-site storage. And frankly, a lot of the stuff went off-site storage. Some of it got weeded. It was kind of a forced weeding. We had to do this because our numbers were just, were, um, you know, getting bigger and bigger each year. And I'll kind of show you. Patron count, this is going to be 2014, 2015 fiscal year. We had 1,306,412 gate counts. That number has since gone up. I don't have it on here, but I'll tell you. For 15-16, it is now 1,360,632 is what it was just this past fiscal year. So you can see we're a pretty busy place. Uh, change was 4% that year. It's, uh, it was 4% from here to the next year, for, for, to this present year. So it's growing at a, at a rapid, rapid rate. Our, our average weekday is 8,300 people. It's nothing for us to get 11,000 here in a day. It's nothing. I mean, it, it happens, you know, even more. It happened last year <laughs> frequently. And uh, for a week, we get 43,865 in an average week. That's what we get. So you can see we're pretty popular. That's a good thing. It's a good thing, but the whole idea is you want to make this space something that's going to be uh, a desired space. 
um, our, you know, our full-time enrollment is going up. You know, we need more spaces that are going to get students in the library. They're going to capture their imagination. They're going to get them thinking and innovating and, you know, making and all that stuff. So we have to, you know, for us, we just have to keep up with that. And I think that's all I've got. I can go on and on for this. I just wanted to make it, you know, one of those things where I kind of give you uh, an idea of what we've done, these different spaces. Um, we're hoping, you know, in the future we'll be get some more spaces going, but we've done a lot in the last, you know, in the last five, six years. We've done a lot of stuff here that, you know, um, uh, you know, when people ask me, I always say start small. What can you do, um, as, as, as was mentioned before, what can you do with just a little bit of money to make it, uh, to, to make it better, you know, and make, start with a little space. If that starts attracting attention, make it bigger, go from there. So. That's all I've got, and I would be happy to answer some questions if you guys have it. Great. Thank you so much, Bobby, and, and thank you, Kevin. Um, we already have a few questions in the queue. Um, I, would, uh, I would encourage folks, if you have additional questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box um, in the WebEx here, and we'll get to as many of them as we have time for. Um, so some of the questions that we've already got. Um, Betty early on asked, so how did you choose a consultant to design the new commons? Um, it's, yeah, it's somebody we worked with before. Um, it's somebody that we had, you know, had some trust in about doing some things, and we, we had you know, talked to them about it before. They had some good plans, some good designs, so you know, that initial one was kind of like, hey, let's see what we can do. They've done it before. They work with libraries around this area all the time, so it wasn't like we just, you know, it was somebody that that uh, you know had some experience, and we could see what they had done in other places. So you know, as far as picking an architect or picking a designer, you want to you know see what they've done. That's the best way to know uh, you know what you're getting into. And you know, another thing that you want to do, and I was told this before, is like you know make sure you get what you want, not what the architect or the <laughs> or the designer wants. So they're going to have great ideas, of course, but if you've got something you want to do. You know, you gotta you gotta stick with that. You gotta stick with your guns and say, hey, we're we're gonna do it. We want it this way. Can you design around that? I know your your plan looks great and all, but can you design around what what we're kind of looking at? So you gotta be kind of firm at times about those sort of things. Great, thank you. That that's really interesting working with designers and that <laughs> and everybody's got their own ideas. I can absolutely imagine that. Um, we have several questions here about funding, um, and Kathleen earlier asked, um, how were the renovations funded? I think you mentioned that uh, there were partnerships with, with various um, companies like Adobe and, and things like yep. that, but could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, exactly, yeah, some were, Dell worked with the Brown Room, Adobe worked with the, uh, with the um, Digital Studio, and we had campus, like I said, campus, uh, IT, and as I mentioned before, when their building was was you know deemed unacceptable, you know they were looking at a new building. So uh, there was there was money for a new building at one point that did not happen. So they moved in to us. A lot of the services came into us. So that money was there. I think the money they had kind of earmarked for that, and basically it was kind of one of those exchanges like, hey, university says if you can move these guys in here, we can give you some money because we're not going to build a building, okay? So you can see where some of this money that might have been earmarked for a building that didn't eventually happen might have been around, you know, and that, that's kind of, to, to my best understanding, I wasn't, I'm not an admin, I don't know exactly, but that's kind of how it's been explained to me with some of this money that we did have uh, to get these, to get, to get the ball rolling. And then there are the, the private, you know, kind of partnerships we've had as well just to get things going. And the nice thing about that is, you know, uh, the whole Adobe deal was one of those things where, you know, we were working on the Creative Cloud for the whole campus, you know. And I'm just going to say that, you know, software is great. Everybody loves software, but the thing is, you know, they wanted their name out there and they wanted something that would make it so students would see their name and it was something that we could actually, you know, they wanted something tangible and a space when we all worked, when we worked it out. 
it just it kind of just happened you know it kind of happened that way we were already we already had one we we're looking to get something you know if they wanted to, to go we could always get more going with that so it, it's just one of those things where you know we were very lucky and and the money department as far as and the partnerships and i know adobe has done this at other places as well i think we were the first to get the studio and and get the cloud and all that stuff like that i know they've worked with um I think Central Florida, and you know, if anybody's out there from those places, Miami and some other places, you know, you know, I'm, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think there are some similar things have happened at other places as well. Great, thank you for for the insight into that. That's that's very interesting. Um, one of the other things that seems to be coming up pretty frequently um, in the Q and A is. Um, is uh, we have several questions around um, pre-assessment of like what students wanted or, or how um, student input in designing the space. So for example, Elizabeth uh, asked a little while ago, was there any pre-assessment done towards student wants and needs in regard to the technology or spatial needs um, on, on campus and in the library there? Yes, um, absolutely. We, well, the thing is I, I didn't break it down in this particular, you know, um, presentation but the 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 phase two uh the phase one i don't think there was just let's get something going let's get it out there because if we sit around and analyze this to death nothing's going to happen and i think that's kind of how phase one started phase two we had i was on the group we had some we had some um, staff involved and we had students involved as far as what do you want uh, talk to your friends, and that was part of that whole suggestion box survey type thing of you know what what are you guys looking for, and that's that that bore out the more furniture. Remember, fifty percent, and then the fifty, and then the, the eighteen percent. So almost seventy percent of it was dealing with outlets and furniture. So that was a big thing. Uh, also, with the digital studio, uh, we had the same thing on the planning committee. We had student involvement uh, on that as well, as far as what they were looking for, what they wanted. Uh, you know what we could actually produce you know with that whole situation and the, and the best thing that, that we've seen is you put something out there and you, and you and you and you see how it's used you know is it used is it not used is it pushed out of the way I mean uh, we, early on we thought about smart boards you know no disrespect to smart boards but we thought about it we we wanted to do some of that and you know we ended up not doing that and I just don't know how much it would be used now. There's things here I could point out that aren't being used that we now know. Some of it is, is trial and error. I mean, you just have to, you know, get, get the student input, see what's going to happen. And then, you know, who knew the whiteboards? The whiteboards have been one of the biggest things we, you know, we have, we get the markers checked out in the circulation and they just, we can't keep enough markers. We can't keep enough whiteboards. I mean, we also have glass boards and things like that around now. We've added that to the, the commons in different areas, but, you know, Sometimes it's the most unlikely thing becomes, you know, a big deal. So maybe, yeah, we definitely ask students and, you know, we'll continue asking students and, and watch, once again, watch what are they doing, what are they not doing, and kind of, uh, I always call the, the learning commons in the whole area, uh, I called it early on the incremental learning commons, you know, meaning incremental as far as, you know, adding something here, taking this away, doing, you know, it, it, as I always say, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Thank you for that. That's that's very interesting. Um, one of the other questions we've got here is um, about the disruptions that the renovations may have caused. Um, mm -hmm. And so Jonas asks, do you have strategies for minimizing disruptions during renovations? Was the designer or contractor able to coordinate work during the breaks in the academic year, or is some degree of disruption inevitable? Um, I know you mentioned some of that happened uh, over like a Christmas break mm -hmm. or, or something like that, but could you talk about the disruption to services or, or Absolutely. what the contract was able to do to minimize that? Absolutely, yes. I mean, you know, we tried as hard as we could to get summer or, or Christmas break, but it doesn't always work out that way. We had the Adobe Digital Studio, which opened in October, so you got to realize that thing was going from like February to opening in October. So. That was a big deal. Now that wall had to come down. We had to move 
you know, the exit out. I mean, it is it is disruption, and you got to think about it in terms of, you know, <laughs> we always say around here, you know, it, it's temporary. You know, this is temporary. We, we'll get through this, and I think that's what everybody has to has to think about because uh, they are can they can be just big disruptions. You know, as far as like finals and stuff like that, you know. You know, they'd have the week off. You know, we would say if you can do stuff that's quiet, great. But if you're, you know, Saul's or anything like that, we we can't have that during finals. I mean, there were things like during the day that definitely happened. Uh, but you know, we tried to make it as 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 smooth as we could. I mean, of course, you're gonna have that's gonna happen. You know, I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's just inevitable when you got a big project like that. You can't do it in the summer alone, maybe, or you can't do it. At Christmas, if it's like a furniture setup, you know, like I said, they knocked that out over Christmas, no problem. It's like three, four weeks or whatever. They did it in like two or three days, no big deal. So, um, so yeah, there's going to be disruption. You just got to, like I said, good signs or well, good signs and, and uh, you know, web page alerts, all kinds of stuff that you can tell people what's happening. And, and maybe if it's going to be a heavy noise day, you let people know. You know, to let people know. Um, the good thing about it is, if you go downstairs, um, down below, we don't have as much seating down there. But if you go down below, it's not going to be as as bad, that sort of thing. So, but yeah, there's definitely disruptions, and you just got to have to work through them. Unfortunately, that makes sense. Communicating and, and trying to use the times that you know you have available. That that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from Jasmine um, about the capacity for power. Um, and earlier she, she mentioned our, our buildings were built in 1954 and 1974. The physical plant on campus tells us that we're at capacity for power. Did you add some kind of behind the scenes equipment to accommodate more outlets? Um, and also a, sort of a similar question, did you have to reinforce the existing power grid to add all the extra outlets? And what sorts of accommodation uh, for those outlets had to be made? How much did it cost? That sort of thing. Right. Um, I, I don't know exactly. I know there was there was talk of that as far as how much because we were adding so much more um, what it could handle, and that's something that I, that was definitely, you know, we worked hand in hand with you know campus facilities on all this stuff, and they were like, yeah, we got to put a box in here, we got to do this, and they they knew it, and they were all over it. And that that was that was uh, that was invaluable, you know, just to have them you know with the master plan before we did anything, they sat down and we worked through it and said, oh yeah, we're gonna have to add this here and. And do this. This isn't going to work on you know. And that that was that was one of those things that had to happen. That's all part of the planning process. And you know, up in this uh, digital uh, um, Adobe Digital Studio, we've got power boxes. And every time we want a power box, we have to pop up. We've got a um, uh, a raised floor up there, which is you know one of those things that we wanted because of this very reason. You know, we need a new power box. We need a new this. We need to put something in here, and we we did that for that very reason up on the Adobe, Adobe Digital Studio. But yeah, I can't give you all the specifics for that, but I know that we worked, like I said, hand in hand with facilities to make sure that we wouldn't have power issues down the road. And I haven't heard or seen of seen any of them while these projects were going on because of the, the pre-planning and, and getting in together with them from the very beginning on all of this. Yeah, that makes sense that you would talk to those folks in facilities right off the get-go to, to sort of navigate those issues. Um, another question that we had from, from Julie is how are you training staff to support these new initiatives? So like using the Adobe software, the visualization wall and stuff. So could you talk about staffing a little bit with all of these changes? Absolutely, yeah. Like I said before, um, at the beginning in the Brown Room, the visual, visualization wall was staffed by our campus IT. And they had interns who were trained on how to use the facility and all that stuff like that. So everything was booked through them. It wasn't, I mean, it was, on, you know, it was in the library, but we didn't actually deal with it. That was turned back over to us back last summer or last year, last, well, it was last, last fall, actually. I mean, excuse me, as, last spring is when it was turned over to us. So we've had it for a year now. Right now, we're actually, Starbucks is right above that, that area. So the, the brown room has been closed all semester because the Starbucks is renovating. They like the they like what the the studio looked like, so they're kind of replicating it on the other side, which is you know flattering. Um, but as far as the training goes, as I mentioned before, we have a media re, media resources consultant, and he does all the training in the Adobe Digital area, and he also runs the the Brown Room. 
As far as GIS goes, that is done by uh, CCIT as, as well. They have a they have a you know they have someone who is several people who are full time. They teach the classes. They run that area, and so that's that area. And then the Brown Room is going to be us with uh, our resource consultant and also the Adobe Digital Studio, which is staffed not only with the resources um, a consultant, but also interns and work study for those hours that I had and the, during the presentation with the hours are going to be there. So yeah, it's a training. Um, and like I said, we've done it for several years now in all these areas. So it's just a matter of when, when people come in, people come out, you train them and show them how that, you know, uh, how it works, what, what are, you know, what are going to be your top questions? Here's some of the questions you may get, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a triage of like, here's what's probably going to happen here. Here's the questions you're going to get asked, and they're going to go over that training and then kind of go from there. Great. Thank you. Uh, we've got time, I think, for maybe one or two more questions. Um, we've got one here from Jeremy, um, and Jeremy asks, and this is something that a few people have asked about, I think. Have you conducted headcounts after the renovation? If so, has it shed any light on areas and furniture that are more popular than others? I think one thing you mentioned was the whiteboards. Um, is there other stuff that you've, you've found that with? Yeah, it's interesting because we found, I found this for, I don't know why, but uh, I mentioned the commons. You know, the commons area, you got the west and the east side. The east is the side that, that most of the, pretty much all the pictures were from the east side. The west side, the commons used to be, um, uh, now it's pop reading and pop magazines and, and that, and we've got also uh, uh, branching off from a, a column. We've got some computers over there too, but that side's always been quieter, you know, and I don't really know why. It's just always been a little bit quieter, but that was repurposed from, like I said, current periodicals with a big, you know, the big metal, you know, cage things, situations used to have, but that was taken out and it's quieter. And I don't really know why. Um, uh, that surprised me. Also surprising, once again, when the first iteration of the Learning Commons, you know, collaboration, collaboration, but we saw start, start seeing people by themselves, you know. So we actually put in some new, for, I didn't have a picture of it, but we had put in some new areas of just, you know, uh, individual, you know, it's, 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 it comes off of a column, it runs power throughout the whole thing, but you put it on a column and it's got about, I don't know, probably about seven seats on one side, seven on the other, individual type study type, um, like, kind of like an old Carol or something, but it's different, you know, it's new, it looks nice, but um, that was surprising. You know, people want to be where the action is, but they want to be by themselves, you know, and I've learned a lot about this whole situation as far as behaviors. I could go on and on about this, you know, uh, I saw on the the question what worked, what didn't work kind of stuff. I mean, as far as what didn't work, you know, this is going to be interesting, but, you know, the whole plug and work stations that we have in the Adobe Digital Studio, these big, you know, screens, people plug in and share their screen, not getting a lot of use, you know. I mean, we've got that you see them in use every now and then, you know, but just not as much use as we thought, and that's probably something that, when we get some more money, we'll we'll decide what we're going to do with those and what else we can put in. But there have been things like that that you know that's going to be you know students wanted them at the time and they were going to be you know highly used and they just aren't you know. And I don't know if it's something where people don't want people to see their work or <laughs> I don't know. I mean I know that uh, um, it, it's it's just one of those things you know. Who, who knew you know? And the whiteboard is another thing. We we put them out there and and they're a huge hit you know and I'm trying to think of other things that we thought were surprising. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, that, that's the, the top things right there. There have been others, but that just that just you know sticks out in my mind as far as the surprises we saw. And they, you know, um, yeah, that, that's that's what I would say. That's that's very interesting, and I, I would imagine, yeah, that the whiteboards would be sort of surprising. That that, that would surprise me as well. Um, well, we're coming up on, on the end of the hour here, so I'll, I'll just take a, a moment to say thank you, Bobby, for, for presenting this information on, on the, the renovations at Clemson, and thank you, Kevin, um, for giving us sort of the high-level picture on space reclamation. Um, I'd like to take just a moment, and you won't be able to hear us, but to give, give both of you a virtual round of applause for taking the time to be with us today. Um, and Thanks, thank Mark. You so hey. much. Yeah, Mark, just a couple of real quick ones here. Um, 
There was a question asked about, you're welcome. Thank you, it's been fun. Uh, there were a couple <laughs> questions that were asked though that were related to, to me. Uh, oh. One was around access to uh, the survey results and the questions and that sort of thing. Sure, sure. And uh, yes, we will make that available um, either through, we'll send it to you directly or we'll send a link so that you have easy access to get at the white paper actually with a lot more detail that has answers or has those questions represented as well. Uh, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, if you are interested in taking advantage of the complementary holdings analysis to support and guide, you know, a pathway to assessing where you want to go as based reclamation, we're happy to help with that as well. And as I mentioned, that's complementary. Thank you. I appreciate it. Looking forward to yeah, meeting with you. some of you. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks, folks. Um, I will just remind everybody as we're wrapping up here that we'll send out a link to the recording for anybody that um, wants to take another look at this. Um, so look for that email. Thank you to everyone out there in the audience for joining us today. I, I hope you all have enjoyed the session and have an excellent day. So thank you all and bye-bye.